to a land that's fair and bright where there's perfect peace in that everlasting Jesus has gone to build for me a mansion there I know and the next time that you see me I may be living in my heavenly home the next time that you see me maybe on streets of gold the next time that you see me, I may be wearing a brand new robe. Maybe kneeling at his feet or shaking his nail-scarred hand. The next time that you see me, I may be living in glory land. You come to visit me and knock upon my door you may not get an answer I won't be living there anymore I'm just here for a short while and then I'll soon be gone for the next time that you see me I may be living in my brand new The next time that you see me may be on streets of gold. The next time that you see me, I may be wearing a brand new robe. Maybe kneeling at his feet or shaking his nail-scarred hand. The next time that you see me, I may be living in glory land. Maybe kneeling at his feet or shaking his nail-scarred hand. The next time that you see me, I may be living in glory Good morning. Welcome to Harbor Baptist Church. And uh, we're doing our video streaming here for this morning uh, because of the hurricane situation. We don't know as of when I'm recording how things are going yet, but I'm sure while you're listening to this, you know full well what's going on. So we're praying for God's uh, hand, God's blessing, protection and such as it uh, passes by our way. But while we're, we're uh, gathered together, <laughs> as you were gathered together there in your living room or dining room or where not, uh, we'd like to just have you join me in the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. Uh, this is a, a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, it's a beautifully written, uh, basically, it's a, just a quick letter to a man, his wife and son, and a church. And um, it is a, a, a story of the prodigal, so to speak. It is a uh, beautiful thing there. Philemon, you may already know and have, have read through this. It won't take you but uh, 12 minutes or so to read through, or maybe even five minutes to read through this book. And I trust it will be a blessing uh, to you as we preach through this book. I will, not, I will not divide it up into other messages. I just want to keep the continuity together as we continue here in our, in our study. We just finished Ephesia, uh, well, actually Colossians. And they go together well, and you'll see how that works here in just a moment. Um, but does Christian brotherly love really, really work? Think about that with me, if you will. How about even during situations of extraordinary tension or difficulty? You ever been there? And uh, people trying to act Christian about it? Uh, well, we're going to look here uh, to an example of uh, a little runaway slave. I wish I knew exactly how old this young man was. I'm sure he wasn't a child, but uh, he was a, a young man, let's just call him a young man, named Onesimus, who left his uh, slave master Philemon and made his way. Uh, maybe he had heard the preaching of Paul and, and such, heard maybe Philemon speaking of him, but he made his way to find Paul. 
And the story goes, as we'll go through this message today, about his, his life and time there with, with uh, Paul, his conversion, and then the subsequent uh, time that Paul tries to bring and reunite and make uh, amends there between the two, the slave owner, which would be Philemon, and Onesimus. And so that's what the whole story truly is about. And on how Paul does it is an incredible, incredible way, incredible story. It's, it is uh, God-breathed in, in such a way. It's a real blessing. And so as we look at this particular story, uh, we can look at it maybe from the view of Philemon, uh, from he, the one who is the homeowner, the householder, the, the wealthy uh, man who had slaves. Now, it was a typical for uh, the Roman times there for rich persons to have slaves, to keep things going there with their crops and lands and such. And, and uh, yet he is a Christian, and he also is... Uh, a, a church planter's type, meaning he actually opened the church up to be in his very home. So I could picture him being in a, in a, very, a very nice home, very large home, very accommodating for a church gathering. And within that ability there, he had slaves that would work around as well. And, and uh, well, one of them, named Onesimus, made his way out of there and found his way into Paul and Paul's life. And Paul took him, cleaned him up, brushed him up, uh, saw him saved, and he sends him back. And that's what the story uh, is truly about. And uh, we don't necessarily see an ending. We don't see exactly how it was received. We don't see how Philemon falls on the neck like the prodigal father and you know, the prodigal son and, and, the pro and the dad of the prodigal father, a uh, son, <laughs> excuse me. So uh, it doesn't end in that way, but because it is truly in the Bible, it made its way into canonized scripture, I would just assume that everything that Paul was confident about, about Philemon, it did come to pass, and we could honestly and safely say that there was a great reuniting going on there. Well, join me, if you will, uh, to Philemon chapter number one. It's the first chapter. It's also the last chapter. We have 25 verses here to look at. And we'll make our way through there, beginning verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I've entitled our message here, the bond, From Bondage to Brotherhood. And that kind of uh, encompasses the, the look maybe from Onesimus' point of view. Um, you can look at this from Paul's point of view as well, as the great mediator between the two. And so you can see either Philemon or, or Onesimus or uh, Paul's point of view here as well. But we're going to go with the bondage uh, to brotherhood. And it begins out here, we'll call it the compilations of love. All right, the compilations of love. In the first three verses, um, this is a greeting moving into this chapter. And it says in verse number one, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our, our uh, brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. It goes on and says, unto our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that is in thy house. Well, this is a, a greeting from Paul. He mentions that, that Timothy is there with him as his uh, understudy and, and young man in, in the faith as well. Uh, it, it gives a threefold um, introduction of this particular letter. Now, what I want to point out as well, and this is what really intrigues me so much about this story and, the, and how this really unfolded, is because the, uh, the, the book of Colossians uh, speaks of, uh, of Onesimus, all right? Uh, it also speaks of um, slaves and slave owners there in chapter number four. We just finished that up just a few weeks ago. And that was written at the same time in the same prison that this book to Philemon was. Now, the book, at Col a book for uh, the Colossian church, uh, as well as this, both go to the same city of Coloss. Now, whether this is the same church or not, uh, the, the, the Bible studies uh, don't really uh, rectify any of that as, to far, as far as knowing exactly whether they are the same or not. Um, but if, if it's the case... That's a blessing. If not, well, then we'll see how it goes. But, but Onesimus was the, was the bearer with Tychicus uh, for that first book uh, to bring that book to the church at Coloss. 
He also, now think of this, he also is the one who brought the book of Philemon or that letter of Philemon to Philemon, him being the slave boy. Uh, that, that is uh, just incredible for me to think as, you, as we picture this, her story, the story of redemption, the story of reclamation. Um, it, as as uh, this newly saved, uh, a transformed young man, young slave who knew he did wrong. He was a thief. He was a, a, uh, um, a worthless slave. He wasn't profitable. Um, he was a, a just a, a waste of time, maybe, so to speak. And, and here he is, with nothing said, nothing known, comes to the door of the very own slave owner, bearing a letter from Paul. I could just... Imagine being a fly on the wall on that particular porch that day as Philemon opens the door only to see this young runaway slave Onesimus. So put that in your mind as we're reading through this, that they're right there together, very likely, uh, as this story unfolds. And, and maybe, maybe as he hands the letter to uh, Philemon, he says, sir, Sir, please read this, read this note. I've come from Paul. Would you please, would you please read this before you uh, react or respond in any way or, or hastily? And so Philemon would take and open it up and begin to read it. And he sees Paul's heart there, and he sees the greetings that would be to him and to his wife, Aphia, there. Uh, in verse number two, and his son, Archippus, who we heard of last in the book of Ephesians as well, and that he was a leader there in the church at, uh, at Coloss. And so uh, Archippus, though, is the son of these other two, of uh, Philemon and uh, Aphia. And it goes on, it says, and to the church that is in thy house. And so... He takes the letter, reads on, sees the, uh, the verse number three, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I can imagine him reading it, thinking of it coming from Paul and him mentioning uh, the giving of grace and, and the wishing of peace upon him. Uh, he moves on a little bit further. And this is where we would say that Paul would, would move from the compilations of love, those greetings there, to the character of Philemon. All right, Paul begins to praise him. Paul begins to, in some ways, soften him up or speak kind words uh, before he comes with a very difficult question, a very difficult request. And in verse number four, it goes on to say, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. My goodness, that, uh, there he is hearing in such a way in, the, in his own mind the, the words of Paul. Now, they've met before. Uh, it is said maybe that they, uh, they met each other at the church at Ephesus. Maybe he was saved when Paul was there uh, for years and he was teaching and preaching not very far from where Colossus and, and, uh, is and there and where his church is and his own home. And so uh, there was a connection between the two. I could imagine him thinking and listening and hearing the very words and the sound of the voice of, of Paul as he's thanking him and as he speaks of him being always in Paul's prayers. What a, a blessing that would be. You have the, the man of God, Paul, the, the apostle Paul, who has great authority at this particular time as he's establishing churches. I mean, he was looked up to, he was respected, and he had an authority there that was without question. And to know that that kind of a man of God was praying for him, well, I'm sure, was encouraging to him. It says, And of hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the, uh, the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Well, uh, he had a love. He, he expresses this, uh, saying that I know you have a great love. You have great faith that you display to your Savior and to all the saints. I mean, this is a, a, an encompassing thing that is is mentioned here and a blessing to maybe to the ears as uh, to Philemon as he's listening or uh, here he, as he hears the voice. Um, go on with me to verse number six, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I'll go ahead and read seven. For we have in with uh, for we have great joy and consolation 
encouragement there, a consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He knew how to communicate uh, his faith through his fellowship. And I, as I'm thinking here of the character of Philemon, I'm thinking of a man who's a rich man, um, very wealthy, uh, but yet very uh, humble about it because he's opened it up to, to a church setting. And there he was also a, a, a man, uh, whether he was in some kind of leadership or there, most, most likely. Um, we don't know the exact, exact of the pastor, the senior pastor or not, anything there, but uh, here he was uh, having this openness Yet he was rich. The Bible speaks through Paul that he was very uh, 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 giving. He was very uh, consoling. Um, the, the scripture says they have great joy in hearing. Um, he, he, great, he gave joy. <laughs> All right. He was a man who I could imagine enjoyed the idea of fellowship. Uh, and fellowshipping is, is a, a beautiful thing. Um, I remember the years of our traveling and when we would spend time with preachers and preachers' families and taking the time to, to just play a game, to sit and talk, to have coffee, tea, whatnot, and to have the kids play all kinds of games together or shoot Nerf guns together or play other things and uh, just to be a real blessing. And uh, Philemon was this kind of man. Philemon was a man that was loved that love, it was a lover of men, lover of people, lover of fellowship. He was one who uh, was good to fellowship with, others to fellowship with him because of the goodness that he had there. Look there in verse number six, it says, uh, that thy communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. Where did he get all those good things? Where did he get these good values? Where did he get this, this goodness about him if it weren't for Jesus Christ that people wanted to be around him, that people were refreshed by him because of his presence? I mean, when Philemon walked in the building, everyone just went, wow, now we can get started. I mean, he was just that kind of a guy. This is, this is Philemon, this man who loved to be a blessing, who loved uh, to meet the needs of others. Notice there in verse uh, 7, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints, the, those saints who are hurting, those saints who, who are in the depths of their heart and their soul, in the depths of their stomach, so to speak, they're hurting, and they need a refreshing. And that refreshing says, By thee, brother was coming from this great man, Philemon. He had the ability to meet needs. He had the ability to see the need. And he'd get that through his fellowship with his time with people. What a great man Philemon was. The ability for him also, because of his finances, to be able to touch someone's life and, and cover a need that may be, uh, may be hurting or uh, someone having a difficult time not being able to acquire. But God used Philemon in a great way, in a refreshing kind of a fashion. Well, I'd, I'd just love to meet this guy, Philemon. I think I would love to get along with a guy, not because he's rich. Now, come on, don't be thinking about that. But because of his nature, his good-heartedness, and his love of refreshing one another wherever he came, when he came around. And I think this is good because Paul knows of this, that this is the heart of Philemon. And that's what's going to lend to his confidence in that he's going to do the very thing that is going to be asked of him. And so we see that uh, uh, mention there of Paul and, and the uh, character there of, of Philemon. And now let's look there to verse number eight, if you will. Verse number eight, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Uh, we're going to look at Paul's petition here, or the conversion of Onesimus is the story uh, line for these next several verses. So this is truly the story of his conversion and a little bit more about uh, Onesimus. <clears throat> but it truly is speaking of Paul's petition after his praise of him. He now petitions him in a, such a way. And in verse number 8, he says the word enjoin. Enjoin means to prescribe a course of action with authority. To prescribe a course of action with authority. He was able to say, listen, I have this young man, and he's a, a good man. He's saved, and I'm now asking you to take him in by authority invested in me by God. You're to reclaim this man. You know, he had all, all, ability, all the ability to do that. 
But he didn't want to use the authority card. He didn't have to because he knew Philemon. He knew his character. He knew his love, uh, love for encouragement and uplifting and his, his, uh, his means of doing such. And so he speaks now of Onesimus. There in not only verse um, number 8, but now verse 9. So he goes from the authority there to maybe an alternate style, an alternate way uh, to, to, we would call it just love. Verse 9, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. Being such an one as Paul the aged, he's, he's using his personage. He's using uh, his, his uh, tenure in service to the Lord, his seniorship there. He's trusting that he'll, he'll use that uh, to uh, influence this young, uh, this young Philemon. Um, it says, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He reminds him of where he is right now. He says now the, the actual question, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, which I have begotten in my bonds. He's, he's now, again, remember the porch at Philemon's house. There stands Onesimus. I, I can just a picture as he's reading through, whether he's reading it out loud or not, I can see the expression already on Philemon's face. And maybe Onesimus is, is one that might be beginning to tear up a bit when he's recognizing him reading and taking the time to read through this letter. You realize that it, under Roman law, a man like Philemon could take this man and have him whipped. He can have him stoned. He can have him punished, even killed for being a runaway thief. But he didn't. And he hadn't as of yet. And Paul knew, even by sending Onesimus to his doorstep, that he would not do this to, to, to little Onesimus. That was the confidence that he had. Well, here's Onesimus and Paul describing now the change in life. The man who is standing next to you is not the same person that you knew that ran away from you, Philemon. He beseeches him to have him back. And he says that he's my son there in verse number 10. It, it goes on to say it that way because it lets, lets Philemon know that he is a, a brother in Christ. He's now been saved. He is a, a faith follower of Christ along with now Paul. Life, the, things have changed and have totally changed. And, and Paul's going to describe the, the magnitude of that kind of a change. He says, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Verse 11, which, is, which in time past was to thee unprofitable which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. <clears throat> well, he was. Here's, here's the description now. We'll make our way down through here. These next several verses, each verse has basically a simple description of, Philemon, uh, of Onesimus as he stands before Philemon. He says he's profitable there in verse number 11. He's good and useful. He was unprofitable for you at one point. Now he is very useful. He's not going to waste time. He's going to be a blessing in the ministry. He's going to do you good and your ministry good and your family good and your, your work good if you continue him as a slave there on the, on the grounds. Not only that, verse number 12, it says, "And Whom I sent again... <laughs> Thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. He says he sent him. What does that tell you also? He was willing to come. He was willing to stand there knowing that he could be killed or sent, a, sent to the slaughter. But he was profitable. He had a heart because he's changed now. He's willing to come. He's willing to fess up, so to speak. Look at the next verse as well. Verse 13. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Paul says to him, <laughs> uh, first off, how I want to put it here today is he learned to minister. So he was profitable. He was willing to come. He learned to minister. Paul wanted him to stay with him. He would have the desire to keep a man like this. Boy, this conversion of this young, young slave boy has turned into a great asset to his ministry. 
And he loves the way he himself communicates this newfound faith and how it helps him in his particular ministry and how he ministers unto him in the bounds of the gospel. In the bonds of the gospel there. Wow. Look, verse 14, but without thy mind, he says, would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Here Onesimus stands before him. Not only did he learn to minister, but he accepts the fate of his master. Um, he's trusting that he will be taken in, that uh, it will be done in a willing fashion, not because of the authority given of Paul. And that Paul desired the mind of Philemon, given him the choice. Um, he wouldn't do a thing. He wouldn't keep him without saying what he would be doing and, and without getting permission, even if that be the case. But here he lets him go back, bearing the letter, standing on the porch of Philemon's there, <clears throat> knowing that he could do any number of things to him. So he accepts the fate of his master there. And Paul allowed Philemon to have that choice. Verse 15, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. There in verse 15, he pictures a temporary loss for eternal gain. <laughs> uh, he says, he may have been gone, he'd been unprofitable, he may have left or departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. So it's gone for a time, but now you get him back changed in a whole new person because of Christ. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Now he's standing at your porch door as a brand new man that is willing and able and profitable for you. He's, he's learned how to minister. He, he recognizes have you ever lost something and you don't know why you question you're hurt something goes in a way that you don't imagine These are just ways that God uses circumstances, surroundings, people in your life, dear people in your life, for your good. In such a way, Paul was, could have used, for all things work together for good to them that love God, to, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Oh, Philemon, for you it was a bad thing, a hurtful thing to lose this man after he's thiefed you, after he'd been and transgressed in a way that was worthy of death. And now he stands before you clean. He stands before you righteous before God. He stands before you in a humbled fashion, accepting whatever fate that you may give him. And yet he's not just that. He is an eternal benefit for you coming back to you with so much more to be a blessing. I, I was looking at that verse and, and recognizing the things that happen in people's lives. We don't understand, but when you think it through enough, you know God's got a plan. God's got a reason. God may do this. You may take it as a hurt, but God has it for your purpose, for your good, for an eternal value that you'll never know and understand until you get to heaven. There's finally, man. An internal good, so to speak, as it's written here, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Wow. Verse number 16 says, Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, <laughs> but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and and in the Lord. He doesn't come home, Philemon, just to be a, an added servant, a, a reclaimed servant to step in step with the, where he was before and to continue with the work, although better. <laughs> He's come to you as a servant as well and now as a brother beloved. He's now a Christian. <laughs> 
He's, he, he can be the one who you can refresh with your goodness and how you can be a blessing now to him as your brother instead of just a slave that maybe you would hope would trust Christ someday under your ministry, under your leadership. Here he comes home saved and a brother. He's different. Thank God for the conversion of Onesimus and the change that was displayed here by Paul in the eyes of Philemon on that porch that particular day. I like to add beyond this, the conversion of Onesimus, we of course saw the character of Philemon. And now we're going to see the confidence of Paul in these latter verses. The confidence of Paul. He had this confidence. He had to have it if he was going to send Onesimus to bear the news. Again, that just totally throws me. But there we have it. That's why Paul did what he did, and that wasn't me. If you'll with, go with me there in verse number 17. He says, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. He's not just a slave. He's not just a brother, Philemon. Take him in like it's me. I want you to, if you partner with me, partner with him. The confidence there. <laughs> he wants, he feels that he's just as worthy as he is in the eyes of Philemon. Not only that, he goes on in his confidence there. <clears throat> he tells him about his debts there in verse number 18 and 19. He says, if if he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I, I do not say to thee how thou owest me unto me, even thine own self besides. Paul is saying here that he's got a debt. Yes, he's a thief. But everything in every fashion that he hurt you that is your loss is now going to be reclaimed through me, my name, my ability, my riches. That is going to cover everything that this man before you has developed against you. I will cover all these needs. I also know in verse number 20 that he was confident that Philemon would do what he does best to refresh and bring joy and fellowship. Look there in verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. He's saying to, to the, the great encourager Philemon, the wealthy man, the one who meets the needs, the one who can reach out and, and put a smile on someone's face. He's saying, do that to me by what you do with Onesimus. Refresh my bowels. See, he was confident that he would do this because he knew the character of Philemon, that he would be the one to welcome him in and to refresh the bowels of Onesimus, who stands there hurt, knowing he was the one who failed. He's the one who transgressed. He's the one who sinned, who thieved, and was shown worthless and then ran away. Now because of Christ, because of Paul, he, can, he has the ability to stand there humbly before the, the accuser. And the one whom he harmed and has forgiveness. What a story this is. But Paul knew how he'd handle it because he knew the character of Philemon. Look there in verse number 21. And having confidence in thine obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do, notice, more than I say. He says, not only are you going to refresh his bowels, are you going to refresh my bowels and give me that joy, but you're going to take him in and you're going to care for him as a brother beloved. You're going to do over and above what we would imagine because of your great love, because of your ability Philemon, I have, I'm confident that you'll handle that. And then he says this, verse number 21, having, uh, um, verse 22, but with all prepare me also of lodging. I guess it was soon for him to get out. 
We don't exactly know when or all the details that were there, but he was trusting, based on the circumstances he was in, that he would soon be able to leave there. He wanted to go meet him. He wanted to go see him. It says, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Well, his desire was to be there and to see this glad reunion and to take part in the refreshment, take, fo- the, take part of that fellowship. Wow, what a time it would have been, could have been, whether it happened or not, for Paul to be on the scene and to witness this great, great reunion. Well, notice with me as the, the book ends, right in verse number 23, 24, 25. We see the commendations of the fellows. The commendations of the fellows. These fellows were five men that were working there with Paul at the time of the writing. Those that would be giving greeting as well to the church there and to Aphia, to to Philemon, Archippus. These five men were uh, Epaphras there, verse 23, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He speaks of him as he's the prisoner, fellow prisoner, Epaphras. How about the prodigal there, Marcus? John Mark was there as well. And uh, how about the partner that was there? Aristarchus is mentioned. And the pauper, we'll call him a pauper. (laughs) He having loved this present world after this point, and he left. He was the one who would run away here, but we'll call him the pauper. Demas was there, as well as the great physician Luke, or Lucas, it says, my fellow laborers there, an ending of verse number 24. So these five men, not only were they giving greeting, but they're giving credibility. If they could, they'd say, yes, Philemon, we agree with Paul. We've seen this Onesimus. He's been here with us. We give that same credibility. He is what he says he is. He's a new creature. He's a brother, and we love him, and we are fellow servants together. We, we, we boast, we cheer on, we're, we go and, and we, we'd say, with Paul, please accept this runaway back home. As I look at that story, we look at this story here, it's, it's exciting to me, because as we Tell the story of Philemon, the one who was transgressed. The rich man, the one who loved people dearly, was scoffed and a man runs from him. Only to come back to him because of a mediator named Paul who finds him where he was, lost on his way. You know, you and I are like Onesimus. You and I are like that sheep that would go away. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And he hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hmm. We're the Onesimuses. Paul here was the Jesus, the mediator that you and I needed. See, there was a day you ran away from God. Oh, it began in the garden because of that sin nature was there, but you chose your sin beyond, and you chose to sin. You chose to be that thief. You chose to live that life. And maybe there was a day, like it was in my life, trust it was yours, that you felt like that runaway. You felt the loss. You felt that there was no worth to you. You felt like you were carrying a heavy burden. You had transgressed a horrible, in a horrible fashion, a great and mighty person being God. And then you had a confrontation with not Paul, but Jesus. And that Jesus, what, what did he do? He made you profitable in your conversion. He made you willing He made you a minister. He made you to accept the fate of what God would do, whereas you would go and stand before God. He changes you from a slave, you and I, to a brother, to a son of God. Can you picture the mediator, Jesus Christ, who stands between God and me, God and man, 
Philemon would be the God, would be God himself. That great encourager, the one who was hurt and lost. You and I are the Onesimus Jesus. There is the Paul. Puts it all on the line. Covers all your sins. <laughs> Jesus took care of all my transgressions. He carried it on his back on Calvary for you and for me. He bore it all. All your sins are gone. And now, because of a love letter that we got, we can go before God in such a way, in a form where Jesus can be right there and could say, God, accept him as you accept me. I've taken care of all of his debts. All of his sins are gone. He's no longer a, 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 an evil slave. He's no longer a wicked person in Christ Jesus. He is a son like me. Accept him like you would accept me. That's the story of Philemon. And if you uh, know Jesus as your Savior, you saw that picture all, all as we read through Philemon. If it hadn't, I trust it opened it in your eyes a little bit for you so you can rejoice with me. The story of Philemon, this great, wonderful, exciting, exuberant, rich, forgiving man that forgave this poor lost boy who had been totally changed and accepts him back into the fold. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my, my prayer, my prayer is that you'll see <laughs> This comparison of salvation, I didn't even use the last point <clears throat> or mention it earlier. I'm going to pray. Our Father, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed. I know this is being recorded and there's absolutely nobody but Chris here in the auditorium. But I think of myself as that Onesimus. I think of myself as, as the runaway. God, those that are listening here, if they don't know Jesus, Lord, help them to see themselves as that selfish, prudent sinner. But that can come and have an exchange with a Savior, Jesus Christ, who can pick him up, dust him off, forgive him, cleanse him, change his life, and send him back to a heavenly Father who will love him and keep him forever. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful picture of, of redemption, of salvation we have here in this book. Bless, oh, Lord, your people. Lord, if there's someone that needs, needs Christ as their Savior, may they please call the church. May they please send an email, come to our house, whatever. We would love to take that time to show them their Savior, Jesus Christ. And for all the others that are listening to this, Lord, may we be grateful and thankful for this book, this story of redemption. May it humble us and rec help us to remember who we were and yet how profitable we can be for God. We can lift up and lift ourselves up and by the grace of God and get these things done for the Lord. Be something special. Be a great minister. Be ones that, that can have this beautiful relationship and make eternal value in the losses that we had, had in our past. God bless us, we pray. Have your will and way in our lives. Again, thank you for this book. Thank you for this love letter. May you enrich us and encourage us through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining uh, me. As we mentioned, getting through this book, I appreciated it. I don't know how long we spent in it, but I trust it was a value to you and a blessing. Again, what a beautiful story. And may you be that Onesimus and run back to God by virtue of Christ. God bless you.